very much, Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see a full room. And uh, let me just get my papers in order here. So as, uh, as Thomas said, uh, it's, uh, it's been a long-standing sort of relationship between uh, Stockholm University and the Stockholm Resilience Center and Cornell University and the Civic Ecology Lab, and we're very, very pleased to be here. Um, it's obviously a, a privilege for us to be not only with some old friends and, and some new friends, but also in the midst of this place and with its great history. Um, and I want to thank you, especially Thomas and Marie, for, for great uh, organization and logistics uh, getting here so smoothly and taking care of all the details for not only today but for the next week so thank you very much for that and also Agneta for your help uh, with this seminar here today. So Rich and I, Dr. Stedman, I'll call him Rich probably for the most part, uh, will be presenting jointly uh, today and and as Thomas mentioned this is part of a week-long uh, series of, of activities so this will be sort of setting the stage for conceptually for some of the things that we'll be working on throughout the week um, and uh, so if any of you are able to, to join in any of that throughout the week, most welcome, as, as Thomas said. What I'd like to do now is just uh, on one slide, just take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about the, this history of, of this MOU and this collaboration, because I think it sets the stage for the kind of collaboration that we're talking about and even some of the ideas that, that we'll explore with you. This is a bit of a uh, scary gram. Uh, but it's just, it's, just a, it's just a way to show sort of on a timeline from where we've come and, and where we're headed. Um, you can see that in 2008, I think that's basically where this began at the Resilience Conference where I met Thomas and, and Stefan and Henrik Ernsten and a few others um, and we began to collaborate at that time. We, we then worked together. You can't see this very well, this green one here, but that's the Million Trees New York City uh, program uh, where Thomas was invited to come speak as a keynote speaker and, and we were able to further some of the research that we might uh, conduct at that time with other partners including the U.S. Forest Service, other uh, partners at Cornell including Rich, that's the first time he kind of touched the Stockholm Resilience Center in its, in its universe. That uh, then led to the City Biodiversity Summit in Nagoya in 2010 where we did some uh, a number of different projects and interesting research uh, work, including kicking off uh, Urbis and a number of other projects that we might briefly discuss. That led to work in uh, Shanghai at the uh, World Expo also in 2010. Then came the Memorandum of Understanding between Stockholm University and, and the Stockholm Resilience Center and Cornell and, Cor and the uh, Civic Ecology Lab, which, has, which was then followed up by a number of activities. After that time, we started to think about joint research projects and collaborations and funding that we could be getting involved in. We, we met at Resilience 2011. Rich presented there. I presented there. A number of my colleagues in this room presented there in a session uh, around a book that we're working on as well as some other sessions. And we held the first of our workshops under this MOU at that time and developed the beginning of a research framework and some parameters for what we might do. Uh, some of that was manifested through some funding that resulted of that meeting on the Cornell side and the Stockholm side for Rio Plus 20. And then uh, we met again in, at the Ecological Sustainability Conference Eco Summit in 2012, had another one of those kind of meetings, which results in where we are today. So that's just a, a, a quick historical uh, tour, whirlwind tour, if you will, of where this uh, collaboration has gone. I hope that it presents an opportunity for many of you who are potentially interested in some of the work that we're going to go through now uh, in, in terms of uh, basically an invitation to join this, uh, this momentum, if you will. So Rich will have an opportunity when he, when he steps up here to give you a little bit of his sort of background and framing and, and his... Uh, uh, sort of context through which, uh, lenses through which he'll be looking at some of this, but I will do that now in a sort of broader sense. The first big idea uh, that informs this positive dependency, urgent biophilia, uh, restorative topophilia, is this notion that humans have lost their ecological identity. Uh, and that um, we have argued in a number of different uh, senses that that loss uh, indicates a loss of resilience and adaptive capacity. Um, among humans in social ecological systems. Related to that is how then, if that's true, how can ecological identity then be recovered or remembered uh, in, in social ecological systems, whether they're rural or urban? Uh, 
And then further, according to my own interests, are there clues, and this is, this is very important from my work, are there clues about how we can recover this ecological identity in the way we respond to large-scale disasters? In other words, when the, when the proverbial stuff hits the fan, what we do as a society may lend clues to how we can operate more generally speaking in, in times of less extreme circumstances. So I'm actively studying the way we interact with nature in post-conflict, post-disaster, and those sort of extreme perturbation sorts of uh, uh, circumstances. Hoping to a answer that third question there about those clues. And then finally, how should we value community-based ecological restoration? in human vulnerability and security contexts, but more broadly, I think, how we should value them in urban sustainability planning contexts. So that hopefully gives you a, a sort of background and framing of my work, uh, the, the focus that I have, and, and that will help, I think, as we think about urgent biophilia and uh, restorative topophilia. Drilling down a little bit on that, um, I'm, I'm intrigued by some of the, the comments that uh, Dr. Folke made early in the uh, sort of resilience literature, well, not that early, but 1998 or so. Uh, these quotes here, I think, are, are fundamental to, to what's sort of informing uh, my, my work. When I, when I gave my talk at the Resilience 2008 conference, I was exploring these, this idea of sources of resilience. I believe Thomas mentioned that briefly in his introduction. And I was intrigued by these, these quotes, these statements. Uh, and I was sort of nibbling around the edges of those ideas, completing my PhD work in post-Katrina New Orleans. And my work is there was generally focused on sort of social ecological resilience in highly disturbed contexts, as I mentioned earlier. And fundamental was this argument put forward by Berkus and Folke that systems that demonstrate resilience appear to have learned to recognize feedback and therefore possess these mechanisms by which information from the environment can be received, processed, and interpreted. So in, in that sense, what I recognize was, th was those scholars were going further than simply recognizing that people are part of ecological systems, but they were actually attempting to explore the means or the social mechanisms uh, that bring about the conditions that are needed for ad adaptation in the face of disturbance and other processes that are fundamental to social ecological system resilience. And so one uh, social mechanism extensively documented by Berkus and Folke was uh, traditional ecological knowledge. What Rich and I are working on uh, asking is what other social mechanisms might exist and how does one go about identifying or describing those mechanisms in urban systems or even systems experiencing extreme disruption across what we could call peopled, peopled landscapes. And so our, propos our proposition is that urgent biophilia and restorative topophilia, and when you mash those together, the combined idea of positive dependence, uh, can be viewed as, as uh, Berkus and Folke call it, tangible evidence of social mechanisms behind social ecological practices that deal with disturbance and maintain system resilience. So if it's warm in here and you may fall asleep soon, these four bullet points are the things we hope you walk out the door with, and I'm doing that now instead of at the end. Uh, the, the, these are the main messages. One, that the, the deficit-based perspectives on not just urban systems, probably all peopled landscapes, are barriers to movement from undesirable to more sustainable system states. We will come back to this problem of deficit-based perspectives. Second, that issues like ecological identity, human exemptionalism, anthropocentrism, uh, and resource dependence as a construct contribute to uh, these barriers. Third, that urgent biophilia and restorative topophilia may enhance ecological identity, which then would be beneficial to this idea of positive dependency. And finally, that positive dependency may start or restart or expand virtuous cycles that confer desired resilience in, in the systems that we're interested in, interested in managing. So the roadmap for the rest of our time together is that I will briefly go through these key terms. Now these are, it's important to distinguish the idea of biophilia and topophilia from urgent biophilia and restorative topophilia. Biophilia, I will explain, is a more general term. Urgent biophilia is a very specific idea. And the same would be true for topophilia and restorative topophilia. So I'll go through these key terms. And then I'm going to hand it over to Rich, who is going to 
right around the time of introducing positive dependence take us on a, a very interesting tour about how this term came to be from the rural sociology and then take us into how it applies in an increasingly urbanized context. We'll go through some of that information and, and some of those ideas with Rich. I'll come back and talk to you a little bit more and, and conclude uh, with, with urgent biophilia and then implications, caveats, and conclusions from there. You'll see this slide again a few times just so you know where we are in, in, in the process of the talk. So first, resource dependence. How many of you are familiar with this term? Yeah, about half of you. Um, obviously, this comes uh, out of the sociological tradition, especially rural sociology. Um, here's one definition from one author as a description of the unique relationship between the users of, environment, of environmental attributes and the environmental attribute itself. Uh, there are a number of other definitions. I'll leave it to our sociologists, rural sociologists, uh, environmental sociologists, I guess would probably be better, to unpack that further. But you get the picture. Obviously, the photograph is of, of timber, uh, of a logging industry, and often that's one of the many sort of resource dependent activities that are discussed in that literature. So that's one concept I want you to keep track of. Another one is this concept of urban systems. Uh, I mentioned Henrik uh, a little while ago. He and his colleagues, uh, I think, made a very strong point in an article from 2010 uh, here that you can see, but I'll read it for emphasis. Given its origins in ecology, it's not surprising that most resilient scholars have historically been interested in empirical analysis of non-urban areas. Uh, and they've devoted less attention to the specifically human and social elements of human-dominated systems such as cities. We are obviously very interested in, in uh, taking up uh, that cause, that challenge. And then uh, Dr. Barthel's here as well, another, I think, great quote uh, that, that gives me a little uh, push, and perhaps Dr. Stedman as well, is what is largely still missing in social ecological resilience theory is a treatment of cities and urban areas including the historical lessons that can be drawn from distant urban pasts in regard to sustaining ecosystem services during times of hardship and crisis. Now, I know a number of you are working with uh, Dr. Elmquist and others on the city's biodiversity outlook and a number of other products. There's an urban theme here. So certainly there is work being done here. But the idea of, of drilling down to some of the social mechanisms, I think, is, is open. And we hope to collaborate more with you, not only through this week, but in, in coming months and years around that, around that subject area. Ecological identity is, a, is an idea. A lot of what we're talking about today is based on a paper that just came out recently in, in Ecological Economics, and, and I hope you'll read it if you, if you have the opportunity. Uh, positive dependency is, is part of the title. It's easily found. Ecological identity figures in largely into this discussion. Um, Clayton, I think, puts, puts the uh, definition very clearly. One part of the way in which people form their self-concept a sense of connection to some part of the non-human natural environment based on history, emotional attachment, and or similarity. And that affects the ways in which people perceive and act towards the world, including policy. Uh, we've had some conversations about how this might play out. Um, and that, and that in includes a belief that the environment is important to us and who we are, or not. Uh, and so I think that's highly relevant to any discussions about sustainability and policy as we move along. The, word, the term biophilia comes from uh, E.O. Wilson, sometimes thought of as a pretty contentious idea, especially when married to the idea of sociobiology. Uh, it's a 1984 and on concept. No matter how contentious it might have been, it is regularly found in the literature. Uh, and it's being used, especially in the gray literature, often, to, as shorthand for greening and whatnot. And um, for better or for worse, it is, it is in the lexicon, and there are some uh, pieces of biophilia that are very useful. Uh, Stephen Kellert, a, a colleague of a few of us here, uh, also picked up the, the ball, if you will, and ran with it quite a ways in his <coughs> edited volume on the biophilia hypothesis, and then went later and worked with biophilia in, in design, urban design especially. And the concept of biophilia, this is just a point that I'll come back to later, so you'll see this slide one more time. With Wilson and his biophilia idea originating in 1984, there was a design proliferation component, you can see. And that biophilic design book and Building for Life and now a handful of other books uh, around uh, design, utilizing ideas out of biophilia. On the environmental health side, Frumkin and colleagues did a, did a lot of work uh, looking into what biophilia might mean in terms of health and well-being. And then myself and, and now a few other colleagues working uh, in social ecological resilience and human security as it relates to biophilia. <clears throat> 
Topophilia uh, is, is a term that I had not heard of until I started working through some of these ideas with Rich. Uh, basically, I'll leave it at it means a love of place. Biophilia, obviously, love of life. Topophilia, love of place. And there, this gentleman here, uh, a colleague of, of Rich's and maybe Dr. Heberlein, who's here, uh, was one of the founders, I suppose, of that idea and that, and that theory. And basically that a place is a center of meaning or a field of care. And it's based on human experience, social relationships, emotions, and thoughts. So those are the, the fundamental uh, ideas that I'd like to, you to take with you now as we drill more deeply into these two ideas of, of restorative topophilia and urgent biophilia, which then becomes positive dependence. And I'll just briefly introduce that term because it produces a, or presents a nice segue into what Rich is going to talk about. Um, Positive dependence uh, is this notion that, that is based on some statements that uh, Neil Adger and others had been making in about 2000, talking about whether or not dependence on natural resources was related to decreased resilience. And he was originally looking at that in coastal environments and later moved that into some of the other more traditional rural sociological uh, dependency sort of arguments. He raised a lot of questions, I think purposely. I, I'm very glad for the questions that he raised did not come down particularly on any, any one side of the argument of whether or not uh, positive, or whether or not uh, resource dependence meant less or more resilience, but he did stimulate uh, some reactions from people, including myself. And so uh, since that time, I've been intrigued by the idea of is it possible that dependence on natural resources or dependence on nature might be something other than negative? might lead to something other than bad results or less resilience. Um, and so as a result of kicking that around in some of the work I was doing in New Orleans and other urban environments, I presented this idea to my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Stedman, while recreating on, on Cayuga Lake. And like a good rural sociologist, he said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> and me as an as a anthropologist said, but wait. <laughs> and we talked about it for a while, and, and uh, after a little while, I got an email that said, you know, I'm thinking about this idea of positive dependency, and what about this entire set of more positive meanings for depend? And from there, we started a, a dialogue around this, and, and that work has, has ensued. So I think that's a great place to ask uh, Rich, my friend and colleague, to come up here and talk a little bit about, about that. I'll leave it on this slide for you to advance. Thank you, Keith. And I'd like to echo um, Keith's gratitude to um, Thomas and Maria and the Stockholm Resilience Center for, for having us. It's been a, a great visit so far. Don't worry, this happened before I got here, but um, not long before. So <laughs> if I say something funny, just I'll, bl I'll blame the meds. Um, so so as, Keith, as Keith indicated, um, when he presented this idea to me, sort of coming out of, out of the tradition of, of rural sociology, when we think of resource dependence, these are the kinds of images that we see. We think of a strong, when we think of rural places, when we think of rural jobs, there's this strong linkage of rural places with employment, and not just employment, but culture that's highly dependent on jobs that are based on the extraction, the processing, the transport of, of forest products, fisheries, mining, energy, and of course we're seeing a, re a very strong resurgence in this um, around the globe. The other part of this, of this linkage early on in this dialogue is the idea that of course these sorts of jobs are good for rural places. The rural boosters and of course those who are promulgating um, you know, the industries themselves are saying well of course these are good forms of, of development. And early on in the, in the trajectory of rural sociological study on this actually the researchers um, tended to agree. Um, so this is the, basically the traditional booster view when we think about wh what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about resource dependence. We're talking about rural jobs um, based on extraction and processing and again with the assumption that these jobs are somehow better, they're higher paying, they're more stable, they bring inputs of new wealth into the economy as opposed to the recirculation of existing wealth and with the idea then that the what's called the staples and linkages theory that, that even if a region, a country, um, an area is marginal in terms of, of its origins in these sorts of jobs, these sorts of jobs, this form of de development can be used to link to subsequent forms of, of development. And this, of course, 
spun off into a whole bunch of work on essentially the indicators of the well-being of resource-dependent communities. A lot of this work was done in the United States and Canada. We saw a big spate of it um, in the rapid development of U.S. energy boom towns in the 1970s. Along came the Brundtland Report in the late 1980s, and that sort of coupled with lots and lots of secondary data led to a whole bunch of researchers essentially climbing on and saying, how is it that these resource-dependent communities are faring relative to other types of, of, of communities? And so this was really dominated by analysis of, of secondary data, um, uh, much of it in North America, but, but elsewhere as well. Um, so what this analysis showed is that this traditional booster view is essentially wrong. Um, I actually have a great deal of fun in my Intro to Society and Natural Resources class. Um, when we get to this section in the class, I say, about what proportion of jobs in the rural U.S. do you think are tied to the extraction processing of timber, fisheries, agriculture, mining, and energy? The guesses usually start at about 25 to 30 percent and range upward and range upward from there. Um, and so this is still a very, very dominant view of how rural places work. Turns out that these estimates are off by about an order of magnitude. It's more like three or four percent of, of all jobs in rural places are associated with these industries. The other part of this is that most of the analysis shows that the outcomes of this form of dependence, here's why, of course, when Keith posed this question to me, I think we were in a duck blind, I said, no, no way. Um, most of the analysis shows that that the sorts of places that depend um, in this way have negative outcomes. Higher rates of poverty, higher rates of ed unemployment, education, the linkages don't come, leading actually to core periphery theories of development and uneven development. Rather than a convergence over time, we actually see a divergence over time in the fortunes of, of, of these sorts of, of communities, which have then sort of talks about in North America, but in the global context as well, the resource curse. And if you do resource economics, um, you've certainly heard the language of, of the resource curse. And so now we essentially have a new truism, right? The original truism, resource dependence is good for rural communities. The new truism is that resource dependence is bad for rural communities. I'd like to gently critique this in the context of the conversation that we've had and some subsequent thinking that we've had since then. Basically, um, if you'll forgive me a brief joke, I mean, it's the story of the guy who's walking along at night with his head down. Um, guy comes up to him and says, what are you doing? And the guy says, well, I've lost my watch. And the guy, well, let me help. Did you lose it around here? And the guy says, no, I didn't lose it here. I lost it three blocks over there, but the light is a lot better here. I can see really, really well. And so I think that's essentially what we have happening with some of our conventional definitions of resource dependence. We have tended to let our thinking about the nature of the construct follow the data. We have good available secondary data sources. When we have data sources, it's very easy to reify the concept based on the data that you have available. So that's one of my general, general critiques. Second critique is that we have a scale problem um, in terms of trying to understand dependence. When we think about the kinds of scales that Keith is talking about and that we'll talk about a little bit later, the mismatch between broad aggregate secondary data that are often collected at the county level um, in, the, in the United States, which are not the same as communities, um, tend to not actually map on lower level outcomes particularly well. Second, a third critique is the idea that there's a huge diversity of outcomes. When we think about how do resource dependent communities do, the answer is it depends. It depends on the context. It depends on the time, the place, the resource that we're talking about, and even the kinds of indicators that you use to indicate well-being. It depends on whether you're talking about poverty or whether you're talking about migration or whether you're talking about unemployment. Finally, there's this lack of subjective indicators, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so, as you might suspect, I think this, this needs essentially to be challenged. I think we're conceptualizing the concept far too narrowly, and then there is this lingering question about the applicability of all of this to urban systems coming out of this very rural context. So a few ways that the thoughts about resource dependence have started to be um, expanded, first and foremost is this idea that, that we can still think about employment-based indicators, but we don't need to simply focus on extraction. We can think about employment based on ecotourism and, and other, forms of, other forms of employment. 
A second expansion is that when we're talking about dependence, dependence is more than employment. We can think about how it is that communities and individuals, as it turns out, come to depend on a resource in a way that doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily captured, um, captured by, um, by employment. So what I argue, what we argue, and what we argued in our, our ecological economics paper is that we need to look at actions and we need to look at psychologies at multiple scales. And so I think there's two key conceptual and methodological issues that are sort of uh, muddying the, muddying the waterhole, if you will. First of all is this conflation of dependence as a psychological state conflated with behavioral indicators. And then second, as I've alluded to, is this issue of scale. Who really depends? Do communities, do counties, do nations depend or do people depend or both? So we put together um, this conceptual typology of dependence that essentially looks at whether we're thinking about a psychological definition or a behavioral definition of dependence, crossing that with our unit of analysis question, whether it's an individual or whether it's a larger aggregation. And so you can do the math here, but essentially, you know, we're looking at an individual psych psychological explanation. An individual can certainly feel dependent on a resource. An individual can express that behaviorally. Also, this can happen at the community level. We all know that, that notions of communities are not necessarily held solely at the individual level, but they're culturally constructed, they're reinforced by policy, um, and so not all of these things necessarily um, hold simply at the, at the individual level. So this is, I think, sort of a transition to thinking about positive dependence, and this transition from deficit-based perspectives to asset-based perspectives. So basically, when we're coming out of the rural, soci rural sociology literature, some of the synonyms for dependence that we see are addiction, reliance, craving, that all imply vulnerability. All imply that resource-dependent communities are vulnerable in, in a lot of ways. And as I've suggested, so do most of the findings, the way we've con conventionally tended to measure them. But there is another class of synonyms out there that Keith and I have gotten quite interested in, this idea of trust, confidence, belief, and faith um, that imply potentially something, something much more positive. And so what we're looking at in our work is whether this base of confidence can provide this basis for, for action, a stronger sense of community agency, potential, um, potential resilience, and, and thus foster a form of positive dependence and virtuous cycles. And so this is essentially the same, the same topology that I showed you, but simply populated with positive outcomes that we might think of and, and negative outcomes as well. And so we can see, for example, up in the, up in the uh, upper left quadrant, um, we see you know, a, ne a negative psychological outcome could be risk aversion. An individual could be risk averse, unwilling to change. There are positive outcomes such as attachment and biophilia. And I'll let you just, just, just look at those. But essentially the idea being that we can think of all of these quadrants as potentially populated either by negative outcomes or by positive outcomes. So, um, second, so in terms of community aggregate level, um, you know, we can think of negative outcomes, communities having a collective sense that that um, they have few other options versus a more positive sense um, that they can that they can move forward with some confidence. So the question that we're looking at is what sorts of circumstances do, does dependence lead to um, virtuous cycles or a form of positive dependency? And so as Keith promised, here's our little check-in. We're about, about halfway through. Um, I would like now to transition to start to talk about really what's sort of core to my area of, of work, which is topophilia. Um, and moving towards restorative topophilia, thanks to, thanks to Keith and the group. So when we think about topophilia in general, um, a lot of the work that I've done, um, I guess that I'm best known for is, is place attachment. I like to think of essentially place attachment as almost synonymous with, with topophilia, but much more empirical. Um, I tend to like to measure things. Uh, Keith, Keith uh, mentioned my, my first encounter with the, the Resilience Alliance meetings, and I sort of joke that I was in Tempe wandering the halls with tears in my eyes looking for someone who was willing to measure anything um, and <laughs> found it after a while but it but it but it but it took some looking um, and so as Keith alluded to um, 
Topophilia is not simply concerned with the biophysical environment. It's concerned with social relations, it's concerned with the built environment, it's concerned with familiar landmarks, some of which may be quote unquote traditionally environmental and many of which may not be. I mean, so here we are also talking about the corner grocery store, we're talking about the neighborhood elementary school, and we're talking about these other forms of landmarks besides just environment that basically produce meaning and produce place out of space, a sense that here is a place that has certain meanings. And so a couple key things about this. One is that in somewhat in opposition to biophilia, these are not seen as innate, right? These are seen as constructed. You construct meanings for places through the kinds of experiences that you, that you have there. Um, and there are some critiques about this that maybe we can talk about in, in, in discussion as well, but that's sort of the, the, the essence. A second, probably even more important element is that they're based on symbols. And so when we're talking about place attachment, it's not enough just to know how attached someone is to place, but it's really important to also know what kind of place it is that they're attached to. What are the meanings? What are the descriptors? What are the adjectives? What are the symbols that are attributed um, to the place? I landed in Orlando Airport this morning, and the first sign I saw was, Welcome to Stockholm, um, the capital of Scandinavia. Um, I mean, so here's a very clear communication of a meaning, right? Maybe off-putting to folks from, from other countries throughout Scandinavia. But so here's, so here's an assertion of meaning. Here's something that is being said about, about Stockholm. And so it's important that we keep, keep in mind attachment, which is the evaluation, the caring, the love, um, as well as, as um, meanings in terms of the symbols that we are attached to. And so to transition to restorative topophilia, basically we argue that, that when love of place can foster individual and collective action that repair or enhance valued attributes of place. In other words, something that you care about, some meaning that you care about is under threat from some sort of change. And so it requires both this strong attachment as a precursor for action, and it requires that you see that there is an important <coughs> meaning that is, that's potentially under, under threat. And so much of what we're, we're looking at and what we hope to move forward in, toward in the, in the um, coming years is questions about basically what's going to account for tips within the resilience language that are virtuous versus, versus vicious. And I would argue that mostly we're talking about meanings rather than attachment. And so this idea of a diversity of meanings Potentially, we all love diversity. We all think diversity is supposed to be a great thing. When we're talking about a diversity of meanings, um, it's, it's certainly a double-edged sword. And we need to think in terms of how people are going to respond to certain kinds of change um, based on their interpretation of that change through their meanings. How different are the meanings? Are they wildly? Is there one set of people that thinks it's this? another set of people that thinks it's something that's diametrically opposed. And we also need to bring in power. And we also need to think in terms of how these meanings are distributed throughout the population. This is not simply, oh, one person holds one class of meanings and another person holds another. Isn't that sweet? Um, but we need to think instead about which of these sets of meanings are imbued with power, which sets of meanings are those that have been um, put forth in, in, in policy, et cetera. And so, Finally, um, the idea here too that's important is the idea of meanings potentially being change fostering or change inhibiting. This is one of the dark sides of sense of place and place attachment and topophilia is it's, it has the potential to be extraordinarily um, conservative and place maintaining rather than potentially being reflexive and, and responsive to change. And so this is, um, this may be one of the classes of, of, of predictors in terms of those tips. And I think at this point, Keith, I hand it back to you. Thanks, Rich. And, and uh, so the transition now in our roadmap is to go from what Rich is talking about in terms of restorative topophilia and meanings and, and drill down even further. Rich, Rich mentioned the, um, the distinction between what might be talked about in biophilia, especially urgent biophilia, being potentially innate or somehow biologically uh, oriented. And that these er this sort of restorative topophilia might be more of a social construct. One possibility that I'm exploring is 
but what makes social constructs from an evolutionary standpoint or from a biological standpoint? Is it possible that we can dig down into biological, at least somewhat partial biological explanations for even some of the social constructs that we talk about? Obviously, that's a long standing debate within cultural anthropology and other fields, but it's still one of interest when you're trying to look at mining for mechanisms and coming up with sources of resilience, so we, we return to it for better or for worse. Like you saw this slide earlier. Uh, the reason I'm showing it again is just to remind you that there is this proliferation of the idea of biophilia in multiple directions. My, my focus is to remind you that I'm focused on human security as a concept and how whatever biophilia is in very urgent circumstances might play a role in how we think about human security and how that actually plays into or may lead to this idea of restorative topophilia and a number of other social actions shortly after uh, some sort of a perturbation in a, in a system. So urgent biophilia from, from the work that I've been doing in this area, and I would refer you to a paper of the name, Urgent Biophilia, um, I believe in Ecology and Society, 2012, uh, where one important root or basis of the idea of urgent biophilia comes from horticultural therapy. And why? Why must we do that now? <laughs> Okay, and, and so it, within the field of horticultural therapy, which is pretty old, there is this idea that um, when, when people have had some sort of crisis individually or at a family level, even neighborhood level, that they might benefit from the therapeutic qualities of nature. There's been a number of spin-off fields in this regard, uh, outdoor wilderness education and therapy, numerous kinds of therapeutic ideas around interaction with nature. Uh, there's a large literature on that I'm happy to share with you. And obviously, there is also a literature on what the benefits of horticultural therapy might be, including among returning war veterans, an area that I'm working in now post, well, almost post Afghanistan and certainly post Iraq, and in, also in refugee contexts and in prisons. Um, so this, the roots in horticultural therapy are important to this idea of, of urgent biophilia. Another sort of basis within the idea of urgent biophilia is through uh, this concept of restorative environments. There's a, there's a history of the idea architecturally of restorative environments going back to the 1860s where people were building you know, parks for certain reasons in, in some of the larger cities in the US and Europe. And they, and they were based in ideas of, of some things called restorative environments, the great fresh air concepts. And those have been brought along even to today. And I mentioned Frumkin early and Hartig and others, a large literature on the importance of restorative environments. And one thing that's coming out of that environment, or out of that literature now, is that this idea that to see or actively experience plants and green spaces can do all of these things, like reduce domestic violence, quicken healing times, reduce stress, improve physical health, and a host of other benefits of quote unquote greening and being in green spaces. Uh, the literature that you see there, starting with Ulrich and going through to uh, some literature that's just been published recently about the value of community gardening in Iraq. Um, all sort of seem to indicate the importance of restorative environments as a source of individual and, and familial healing, but also as a source of community healing and per perhaps even uh, could be thought of as an indicator for some sort of resilience in those contexts. And therefore, the, the study of restorative environments complements uh, research on the conditions in which functional resources and capabilities diminish in red zones. And I, there's a little picture of a book here that I, I've been talking about for a while now that's really, really and truly supposed to be coming out uh, any day now. I don't know what the problem is with the proofing, but the thing is, the thing has been like imminently out for about a year. But it will be here soon. <laughs> and in that book, by the way, there are 35 chapters, 35 examples of, uh, in various iterations of the idea of greening in red zones or in, in severely disrupted systems, which explore a number of different possibilities, including restorative topophilia, urgent biophilia, and so forth. Another fundamental component of, ur of urgent biophilia is this idea of systemic therapies. We, we, we might be asking in this room now the question, why would, why would gardening or tree planting or other sort of small scale greening activities uh, have anything to do with resilience of, of, of urban social ecological systems at some larger scale? Uh, and, and the reasons are, the, the first thing I would say is that's a good question. Secondly, that's the question that we're working on. And I think that the idea is that there may be within those relationships, both in terms of the restoration of ecological identity and the, and the things that push people towards those, some real important indicators for sources of resilience and the social mechanisms that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and the systemic therapies literature has talked about those kinds, thinking about an ecological approach 
towards uh, a therapeutic uh, environment. And, and, and they are trying to, within that field, address the environment not just as a setting, but as a partner, as an actual active partner in the process of, of uh, interaction and healing. So then there are, then there are th this idea of systems within systems, which should be no, no strange territory for those of you w worrying about complexity theory and other things within the, the resilience uh, community. Um, all of these integrated systems within, within urban context, communication, transportation, manufacturing, and so forth, reflect at some level people's relationship with their place, as Rich was talking about, and also the sort of environmental attributes of those place. Uh, and, and in fact, people's attitudes about environmental attributes, including in this case, you see a picture of a live oak from New Orleans. The relationships that people had with the live oak and live oak line trees in New Orleans actually um, changed the way industry was thinking about re reorganizing after Katrina in a number of important ways in and around the, the, the Ninth Ward. So that systems within systems concept comes to play as well. Uh, given those sort of bookmarks, if you will, within the idea of urgent biophilia, what is it? What are we talking about? So the bottom line is that based on this idea that Wilson has, that, that, um, that humans have an attraction for the rest of nature, uh, how does the rest of nature perhaps attract to us? Or what sort of attraction, what, uh, what kind of attraction manifests itself in extreme circumstances? And if that happens, what are the policy implications for enabling those sorts of attractions to manifest themselves in ways that become uh, morale building and morale improving as opposed to um, other possibilities? And so urgent biophilia then focuses on that. It then looks at how, how that can be a process of remembering that attraction and what ways, in what ways can that uh, sort of urgent biophilia be uh, not constrained. Often uh, redevelopment projects constrain urgent biophilia by focusing on hard infrastructure first and the trees or the green space or the sort of natural resources are highly secondary. That's generally problematic. Um, bio, urgent biophilia is also um, trying to better understand what is this urge to express our relationship with the rest of our ecosystem through creation of these restorative environments. Why is it that it's not that difficult to come up with 35 chapters of examples of people doing greening kinds of things directly after uh, natural disasters or war? Why is that going on? What are the explanations? Well, one might be this sort of innate biological one around urgent biophilia. Certainly uh, where that leads to are these social constructs including restorative topophilia, use of deploy further deployment and creation of symbols and a number of other things. But I think uh, it's, it's plausible that something about our biology is, is, is to blame, if you will. Uh, uh, and we can think about how we might release that in creative ways in, in the future. And, and we would then think hard about how that would confer resilience uh, across multiple scales. If those sorts of biological attractions are important to individuals' ability to cope or re recover or respond or all these other rewords that are associated with resilience, why don't we exploit that or leverage that a little bit more? Uh, not only at the neighborhood scale, but at the policy level scale and the societal scales. Incidentally, and of course we're all talking at high theory levels here, and right? I'm not unpacking a lot of data, uh, although in the next couple of days I will show a, a number of case studies as we drill down on some of these ideas tomorrow and, and Wednesday. But there is another line of thinking that I, would, I want to bring to your attention just to be provocative uh, around biological attraction as a principle. And this is coming from molecular biologists who have come up with this notion called the biological attraction principle. Uh, the, in their minds, it's just like Newton's law of gravitation. It just is. It happens. Uh, these papers are incredibly well cited. I didn't know about them until a, the urgent biophilia paper was in review and it happened that one of the reviewers brought this uh, literature to my attention, which I then uh, integrated. Um, it, 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 this uh, biological attraction principle argues that biological activities and processes and patterns all are mutually attractive, including those things that we do as humans. So this fights directly against this insistent um, exceptionalism and exceptionalism that we often allow ourselves to have as society, as urban planners, etc. So it, it alludes back to some of those things I said earlier about ecological identity and the importance of rediscovering and remembering ecological identity as a matter of policy and as a matter of sustainability. Uh, also, if you're interested in chasing down this literature, um, Agnetti's article there, that 2009 article, 
makes the statement that biological attractive force is intrinsic to living organisms and manifests itself through the propensity of any li living organism to act. And I would argue to live, to continue to survive. So as I, as I said earlier, when, when the proverbial stuff hits the fan, it's real interesting to see what we as yet another carbon-based organism do and what we, what we may want to think about in, the, in those contexts as a management option. Where does biophilia sort of fit into uh, the resilience discourse? I, I like to talk about this. This is probably not the place to go far down that road. Uh, my idea is that where you see uh, urgent biophilia expressed is in the back loop, as related to you know the sort of adaptive cycle of Gunderson and Halling, um, metaphorical as it is. I, I think that where you, where you see this sort of in the K field there, in the K sector, uh, the conservation sector, you see that affinity for nature is, is probably relatively weakly expressed. Basically that Wilson's biophilia is kind of weak there. Uh, society is happy and wealthy and, and fat, but then something happens. Uh, a major perturbation happens and there's a, re a reawakening and a recognition of some of these connections that, that we have for the rest of our biological setting. And in the release phase and then through the reorganization phase is when you would see these biological impulses, this, this sort of urgent biophilia expressing themselves. Um, this is a notion that is, is under, under theorized and I'd like to actually find someone willing to talk a little bit more with me about thinking through the adaptive cycle and, and the possibilities for cases and scenarios in in uh, urgent biophilia. Just quickly, to, to, as a teaser to some of the examples and data that will be presented later this week, there are a number of examples of, of this idea of urgent biophilia. In, in New Orleans, for example, you get a great sampling of both urgent biophilia and restorative topophilia, and I think in a positive dependency sort of twinning way. After Hurricane Katrina, the city was basically written off as a failure of resilience. I saw that actually, actually that phrase in a, in a, in a in a paper. Many of the, the big newspapers, uh, Times, uh, New York Times, Time Magazine and others called New Orleans an absolute failure. In the end though, there was a, a small movement that grew and grew and grew in New Orleans, which was a, a rebirth of New Orleans movement that was centrally organized around a small, uh, originally a small group of tree planters who became uh, basically world renowned for being part of the the uh, reorganization, the sort of phoenix rising from the ashes of New Orleans. And, and still today, that tree planting community of practice that e evolved, emerged as a form of both urgent biophilia and restorative topophilia, therefore sort of re representing a positive dependence on a natural resource, including forest, uh, that, that has, has manifested itself into not only New Orleans recovering much of its urban forest, but also uh, being an example now of a resilient city as opposed to a failure of resilience uh, these, these years later. Other examples, uh, Joplin, Missouri, another city, a small city in the Midwest, uh, experienced a very, very strong tornado that killed quite a few people. And of course, interestingly to me, the first thing you saw in the New York Times was lots of pictures of destroyed trees. This middle picture here was the whole city for miles in all directions had these sort of trees. It looked like the, the World War I images that you would see of the trenches. <clears throat> Shortly after that, as a result, I think, of learning from New Orleans and what they did with, with trees in the rebirth movement, they were immediately planting trees. Many of them were the wrong trees to plant at the wrong time of the year, but this is what they were doing. And because they were longing not for trees so much, but they were, they were recognizing the symbolic value of getting busy with that and restoring that sense of place using these sort of uh, social ecological symbols and rituals to do that. Detroit, Michigan is another example in, in, in the Midwest. Uh, sorry this is so you know, Midwest-centric and US-centric. Um, this is where a lot of the work that I have been funded to do is occurring, however. <clears throat> Detroit has been, been called one of the sort of capitals of, of uh, urban agriculture now as a result of the loss of almost 70% of the actual land mass of, of Detroit to basically urban decline. It, it really, the, the, the vocabulary that you'll read over the last 10 years is makes Detroit a red zone, even though it hasn't experienced it directly a natural disaster or a particular you know conflict. The, the language is it's a disaster area, it's a war zone, it's a bombed out. They use all kinds of language like this to describe Detroit. Meanwhile, there is a, a strong movement to do this kind of greening activity um, in Detroit as a as a resilient response 
utilizing ideas from restorative topophilia, urgent biophilia, and a number of other sort of, uh, of mechanisms, I think, uh, to express their desire to recover and to, to find themselves in a, in a new state. There are also examples internationally. Uh, thanks to Thomas, I've been doing some work in, in Japan after the, the tsunami there, uh, where we see similar things, and I could, I could go on. The analysis of, of these things, you know, it's nice to find huge piles of evidence that this is occurring. This phenomena actually happens. <clears throat> this list here from Greening in the Red Zone are just some, some locations where if you were interested in, in asking very empirical questions, there is obviously uh, some things to look at where we've documented just for the cases, just for the sake of this book. And since then, there are a number of other examples, including the ones I've laid out. So as another teaser, uh, if anybody is interested in, in collaborating on how to, how to think about our relationship with nature, this idea of positive dependency in different locations, and how it relates to uh, urban social ecological system resilience, I think there, this, is just a, this is a small sample of where we could see that happening. So what's the, what's the big deal, you know, kind of getting into conclusions now? What's the, what's the so what here? I think in the context of social eco ecological systems, moving towards linking individuals with groups of people, social networking even, neighborhoods and communities is one of the big pluses of, of why these greening movements matters. Clearly people rally around us. Clearly it has both uh, ecological and political societal implications. And, and those things can be measured and be brought into the policy discussion. Unfortunately for New Orleans, it took about five years of that kind of tree planting before FEMA and others said, oh, tree planting is important to the recovery of New Orleans. We'll actually invest in that now. By then, though, it had already basically been done. <clears throat> too late, too little, et cetera. Normal sort of policy response in the US. Um, but I think there are some lessons to be learned there in terms of the value of of greening in that kind of red zone. Also, uh, an important thing related to specifically urgent biophilia, but the larger discussion on positive dependence is that, that, uh, that this kind of contact with nature isn't just a sort of nice to have in terms of uh, therapy uh, and coping with crisis. It actually has something to do systemically with the way systems can and, and, and perhaps will recover. And I think it's an important piece, of, it's not a silver bullet in and of itself, but it's an important piece of the resilience story that's often overlooked, and there's certainly a need to explore it further. And <clears throat> contributing to the literature connecting individual resilience to the adaptive functioning of larger social systems and networks is obviously an aim of ours with this work, uh, but, but uh, the challenge is, you know, where do we start measuring? Where do we actually get to uh, some of the empirical analysis that Rich is anxiously awaiting some answers on. <clears throat> so uh, implications of restorative topophilia and urgent biophilia in terms of this larger discussion uh, of positive dependency and resilience. Uh, let's just give you a couple of concluding points given the time to, to talk about that. The, the main idea is that you can see that there are a lot of asset-based approaches represented in both urgent biophilia and restorative topophilia that are trying to escape this, this, this problem of deficit-based thinking. So we need to move away from deficit perspectives, which automatically move us in terms of policy towards uh, you know, immediately infrastructure responses rather than sort of larger social ecological responses to disturbance or to long-term planning, which anticipates future surprises and shocks within, within a system. Another important point, we need to, as Rich said, understand better the circumstances under which positive dependence and urgent biophilia are likely to emerge. The, other, the flip side of that, what are the things that are reducing its ability to be manifested? And I think systemically we, we have a hunch about what that is, but we need to really study that, unpack it, examine it, and document it. I think Rich's point here, uh, what might be lost in translation, is an important one for those of us that work in the social science uh, arena, especially as it relates to, so, uh, to uh, social ecological system resilience. What do you lose, uh, sort of lost in translation, with this kind of perspective, especially around restorative topophilia, which is born in a rural sociological tradition, and you apply it now into uh, sort of more urban environments? What's lost, or what's gained? Uh, I think it's not a, it's not a hugely problematic area, but it's an interesting one. It's something that needs to be done uh, for, for, the, for the fields involved. And finally, there is a need for 
transdisciplinary qualitative and quantitative methods. We'll talk about this on day three. Uh, mixed methods, mixed models, approaches that allow us to, to take all this in. I mean, it's, it's, it's across the board in terms of uh, the qual quan debate or divide. Uh, and I think there's ways that we can hybridize this work uh, such that the, that debate isn't, isn't so problematic or disruptive. Uh, I was encouraged by the meeting that we were in just before this talk uh, <clears throat> where we were able to see a lot of that sort of mixed methods, uh, mixed modeling, transdisciplinary activity happening just by the report out, and I'm anxious to hear more about some of that work. So this need for these uh, transdisciplinary approaches that interpret linkages between individual ecological identity at the, at the very small scale of the individual and the community ecological uh, sense of place and the relationships to collective action for uh, sustainable urban systems, I think is a, is a future direction that we're probably going to be pushing towards, not only in the next three days, but even as we, as we work in workshop form to explore future research questions. It's rather warm in here. <laughs> so I'm on the acknowledgement slide now, and it's important to acknowledge a number of people. <laughs> Mainly, our host, Stockholm Resilience Center, thank you very much, Thomas, uh, and the rest of you from SRC and Stockholm University. This has been a, a great collaboration over these years, and I hope what we've, we've uh, showed today uh, is, a, is a snapshot into some uh, useful areas to pursue. I also hope that we accomplished one of our objectives, which was to be a bit provocative and not give away the, the farm the first day. And hopefully that some, some of you, I can see a few of you, some wheels are turning, and maybe there's some, uh, some questions that we'll be exploring together. I also want to acknowledge uh, Rich's home at Cornell, the Human Dimensions Research Unit, and I would thank Rich especially for his collaborative spirit within uh, this work and other things that are following on and as I'm trying to reel him into the universe of resilience. Uh, the, the, my home, the Civic Ecology Lab, has been very supportive of this collaboration and my work at, and of course we acknowledge our home university, Cornell. So thank you very much for your interest and attention and uh, I think there's, I don't know where we are in time, we have time for questions. Yeah. <clears throat>